Hello, this is Matt Brown with part three of Bluetooth Low Energy Hacking. We are going to be discussing in this video how to interact with the Bluetooth Low Energy devices that are out there in the world around us. So uh, in our first video, we discussed the general Bluetooth Low Energy protocol and some of its security concerns. In the second video, we discussed how to sniff Bluetooth traffic that we see. And at the end of the video, we discussed that after we perform that sniffing process, we then might want to take some of that data we see being sent over the wire and then actually send it ourselves to that peripheral Bluetooth low energy device. Maybe in this case, it's uh, something like this heart rate monitor here. So in this video, we're going to discuss how we would go about sending that Bluetooth data. So we will continue on with our slides here. So like we mentioned uh, in the video before, the Ubertooth One is often suggested as this uh, this go-to tool for Bluetooth low energy hacking. Uh, it it is useful sometimes for packet sniffing, uh, but here we want to note that it cannot send packets. It can just monitor. It can just receive packets. And so the greatest tool that we're going to have is uh, some of these other options here. So. Uh, Honestly, like, again, going back to your mobile phone being this fully capable Bluetooth device, this device is capable of sending and receiving Bluetooth data, uh, as well as your, your PC, uh, really similar to your phone. Uh, and then kind of as, a, as an aside to the PC situation is uh, sometimes you will want to obtain a a discrete USB dongle, like not something that's built into your laptop or your PC. This is helpful if you're running inside a virtual machine, if you're in a work situation where you have to run Mac or Windows and uh, you really want to run Linux to do all your Bluetooth hacking stuff, which I do suggest that you do for Bluetooth hacking. And uh, so this, this would allow you to pass Bluetooth through the Bluetooth uh, dongle through to a VM with a USB device. Uh, then we have this device right here, which I'll try to show for the camera. This is a Nordic Semiconductor a Development Kit dongle. Uh, it's, it's the NRF uh, 52840. Uh, this uh, is used with a, pri a proprietary set of development tools uh, called NRF Connect uh, Desktop. There's also NRF Connect the mobile application, which we'll uh, talk about in a little bit on the software side. But that is that dongle. Again, that device is, is a pretty revolutionary piece of hardware. It implements a very discreet, uh, a very simple uh, 2.4 gigahertz radio, and you can actually use it to do Bluetooth low energy. You can do, I've got all the other protocols, yeah, right down there, Thread, ZigBee, uh, a bunch of other stuff. Uh, a bunch, and you, you, can write, you can write your own proprietary protocols and use this hardware to, to transmit, as long as it's on 2.4 gigahertz. But it's just a very incredible uh, piece of hardware. Uh, that I think is really being undervalued in the hacker community as a hacker tool. It's primarily for, again, developers and IoT developers, but I think it has a lot of power uh, for us in the hacker community. So what software are we gonna use with this? Um, on a mobile device, again, like I said, there's this mobile device, NRF Connect, uh, for Android as well as iOS. I know iOS is really kind of a stickler about uh, hacking tools. I think the way they get around that, again, this is a development tool. This is meant for IoT embedded developers so that they can really easily test uh, this, the, 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 the IoT devices, the smart Bluetooth devices that they are developing with their mobile phones. So that's probably the, the reason why it's able to get in the iOS store. Uh, I'm an Android person, so I don't have as much of a problem with that but it's good to know that there's options on both platforms. And then on your PC, there's a very similar application that works only with that dongle. That's the trick. With a mobile phone, you, I mean, it just uses the whatever Bluetooth capabilities are on board. On the desktop application, you do need to have that Nordic Semiconductor dongle in order for this software to work. Uh, we're going to use that piece of software today, uh, but 
you can also use some of these other tools. I have a, some GitHub repositories where I use this bleak uh, Python library to, to automate a lot of interactions. And that's what I actually do for a lot of more complex ep exploits that you need to hit multiple services and sending data and receiving data uh, all at the same time. That's something that it's harder to do with these point and click tools. So if you need to automate a more complex attack like that, uh, feel free to uh, check out my repository there on GitHub and uh, or reach out to me if you have an interest in uh, developing some more advanced uh, Bluetooth hacking tools. I'm always interested in that kind of collaboration. Uh, yeah, so with that, we are going to jump into NRF Connect. So I just uh, fired up this like program. So this is just, this is, uh, so not only can this thing do Bluetooth low energy, it also has a bunch of other, uh, de again, development tools for people who are developing things on this piece of silicon. So we are going to go ahead and open up the Bluetooth low energy application. And then we're going to select our device and here it identifies that dongle that I just uh, plugged back in over there. I'm glad it recognizes it. And then it just shows us that, okay, yeah, we've, we've connected to your dongle, right? So at this point I can, uh, okay, so my, my heart rate monitor is on, it's flashing. And so I'm going to just click this, toggle this option that says sort by signal strength and then I'm going to scan for a little bit and then I'm going to stop. And so I see, I, I, I obviously know like which device is, is this heart rate monitor. So I can see a bunch of devices around me. Like, you know, like you'll, you'll start, you'll start scanning for Bluetooth and you'll start seeing all sorts of interesting uh, devices that you never knew had, had Bluetooth around you. But uh, in our case today, this is our device right here. And we can see something really interesting. Before I have even connected to this, this is 100% passive, a passive scan of the Bluetooth devices around me. We can see that this device is declaring itself to the world to provide a heart rate service. That That's incredible, right? We haven't even connected to it. But let's go ahead and connect to it. So we click this button and we connect. So a reminder from our part one of our video series. So a connection in Bluetooth does not involve encryption or authentication. That would require pairing or another type of pairing that I think we'll see in here called bonding, where it just permanently saves those keys that were exchanged in the pairing process. Um, oh, oh, so here, yeah. So it, we, we, can, we can optionally try to pair with this thing. This device will actually like It'll just crash. It'll, it'll just like crash the whole connection and you'll have to disconnect and start over if you try to, you know, communicate with it securely uh, by pairing to it. But if we don't do that, we see all of these interesting services uh, here. So each of these is, is, is a different service that it's offering. And then within that service, it has some of those like characteristics that we talk about that really we can just think of them as like API endpoints here. So here, uh, the device name, uh, I, this is not exactly the device name that came with this device because I forgot what it was initially because f I don't know why you would ever need to change this device name, but we can see that the read and the write permissions are set on this device name characteristic. So we can actually change this device name. Um, I don't know why you'd need to, but that's the permission there. So uh, going down through some of these other attributes. Um, so here we see one that's not nicely identified as as with a service name. This is a one of those custom services, these custom characteristics, custom UIDs that are not defined in the Bluetooth spec ahead of time. They're they're reserved for yeah, developers, people like you and me, to come along and say, hey, I, I have an idea for a Bluetooth service that's not already predefined in the Bluetooth spec. Well, you can go and define your own uh, set of services. And you, again, you assign to them similar uh, permissions that all the other services have. Um, 
but but this is where if you wanted to understand how to interact with something like this, that's where you're probably going to have to start reverse engineering uh, either the traffic that you see from from part two of our video. You start reverse engineering some of that, tra that traffic that you see from the mobile application and or you're going to be doing some mobile app reverse engineering, uh, which can get in the weeds. But right now we're going to look at some of these other services here so down here in device information i can see all sorts of hardware and firmware and software versions which is really interesting uh, if we're doing some security research uh, there's a battery service and so this battery service is actually telling me uh, the battery level of this uh, so 60 64 in hex converted to decimal is 100 so i'm i'm, I'm all topped off on on my battery here for this device and then uh, the service that we're all waiting for is the heart rate service. So here is that note is that heart rate service with the notify. So again, uh, notify is just a polling mechanism in Bluetooth that says uh, that we can say to the peripheral, say, hey, whenever that device update or whenever that value updates, then send me that value. I don't want to have to just read every you know second or half a second or something like that. So I'm gonna click. This little play button, and we will see it continuously update with uh, with this data. And okay, there it changed. So I can try to wiggle it around, do something to get my heart rate up. So there we can see that uh, uh, 93. So that is in, I believe that's in hex, and so that might have to be that that would have to be converted to decimal to determine uh, what that heart rate value is. So there we have it. Uh, we have, without authenticating at all, have scanned around us, connected to this device, without any reverse engineering of a mobile app, have already been able to do a lot of stuff, uh, and potentially we could do even more uh, with 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 these services up here if we were to do a bit of re uh, reverse engineering to figure out what those are. So. That is it for that demo. So uh, the closing observations. This, uh, these are the closing observations that I have just after doing some of this uh, research. Uh, some of this interest of mine into Bluetooth Low Energy was uh, just in my free time. Some of it was based off of some work projects I was doing. And uh, just, just my first observation is that these there are many low-cost Bluetooth low energy devices out there that have little to no security. Again, uh, the Bluetooth low energy specification uh, not requiring authentication or, or encryption uh, by default on a connection. Uh, it leaves it up to the developer to implement that pairing uh, process, which is, which is probably harder than not doing it, right? So many IoT devices are just not going to implement that. Um, the, my other observation is that some of the tooling and some of the resources and some of the uh, learning information out there is just not as good as it is in the Wi-Fi hacking space. And that might be why there hasn't been as much uh, look into all of these IoT Bluetooth devices. Certainly there's a lot of research going on, but just it hasn't been delved into as much as Wi-Fi has. And so uh, tooling could definitely be a, a, a factor in that. So another observation is that many of these IoT markets are, are kind of dominated by a cost leader uh, business strategy. So that's when obviously a company tries to just uh, have the lowest cost product and then win by volume in the marketplace, right? And so the problem with that from a security perspective is that there's not enough budget for security and so you are left with these really low cost, cool devices that may or may not be secure. Uh, so with that, uh, I hope you enjoyed these videos. Again, like, comment, and subscribe. Let me know what you think. Like I said, if you want to contact me, ask me how to get into the security space, if you have any uh, pen testing work that you'd like me to uh, 
to look into for you, uh, please reach out to me and I'd be happy to help you out. Thank you and have an awesome day.